whatever you want to do. But if you're living a holy life, then, you know, you have to kind of, or you think you have to be a certain way. So uh, I want to read to you a, a few verses, make a few questions. Um, some of them will probably trigger some more questions for you, but that's okay. And, uh, and then I'll show you some examples of, of people who I consider holy, yet they're truly human. And uh, so let's see what we can discover together. Jesus once said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So what did Jesus mean by that? Sanctify them. You know, that word sanctification reminds me uh, of this steps to salvation. I don't know, maybe some of you grew up with this stuff, with this, with this graphic here. Uh, my first year of ministry, I spent with an evangelist. And I was, what, 20, 25 years old? And he would talk about this when he would preach about giving your life to God. And the interesting thing about this uh, here is that it's easy to confess it's easy to repent, and I could deal with those things when I was growing up in Bible classes, in Sabbath school classes, in, uh, in sermons that preachers, or a week of prayer at the school, uh, and then in college, you know. You could deal with the confession, you could deal with the repentance, you could deal with the justification. Those are kind of all good things. But the moment you got to sanctification, then it got really messy. It got so messy, it became discouraging. Because the whole idea that I would hear as a young person about sanctification is that you better be perfect so that you can reach glorification. And nothing has done more damage in Christianity than to tell people they have to be perfect. And when religious leaders do that, then it gets worse. And when Bible teachers do that, and, and then your mom does that, and your da dad does that, and your older brother, and everybody is enforcing. So, so this thing of sanctification can be very scary. And uh, so I, I grew up with this. And uh, of course, there's always kind of a, a, a somebody would, would, would give a big talk about being perfect, and then they would say, well, sanctification is the work of a lifetime. So that was supposed to ease you, see? Supposed to bring you some peace. But then it will, they will bring it back again, you know, and they will reinforce it. So I grew up with this. So I grew up with this idea of sanctification. So when Jesus says, you know, sanctify them, it could be that maybe you find yourself there. Or you had a similar experience that maybe you're still dealing with. Because this idea of being sanctified and being holy is be, and being perfect is sort of like a, an aspiration that we all have deep-rooted in our hearts. It's like we long for it. Yet how we go about it and what does it really mean is what I want to share with you. So here's another verse. In John 10, 36, uh, the Father says, of him whom the, this is John speaking, of him whom the Father sanctify and send into the world. So here we find that the Father thus sanctifies the Son. Okay? Then here's another one. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. This is Jesus speaking. I sanctify myself. So the son sanctifies himself. What does that mean? That they also, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. And then sanctify them, Jesus prays, by your truth, your word is truth. So the Son, the Father, kind of work together to sanctify his followers, his disciples. So what does it all mean? 
at the root of the word sanctification, and the word sanctification is a big word, but at the root of that word is the word sanct, which for those that have a Spanish background or a, or a Latin background, if you know any Latin, sanct is the word for santo, which means holy, simple, means holy. So whenever we're talking about sanctification, we are talking about this word holy. What does it mean? First, I want to clear up. Only God is holy. I am holy, he says. I am holy. So God is holy. And, um, and this is way in the Leviticus, which, which is an amazing book in the Old Testament, filled with beautiful stuff and ceremonies, but at the core is this idea that we, that we are part of a holy God who invites us to be part of him. And he says, I'm the only one that is holy. No human being is holy or pure in themselves. So let's get that out of the way. I wish that someone would have told me this when I was a teenager, okay? Because everyone was pressing me and pressuring me to, to be holy, to be perfect. I, I remember in high school, I had the opportunity for two years to, te to, to, um, to take Bible studies from this British pastor. And another guy, another friend of mine at school, we would go every Sunday and spend two hours with him. So he helped me a whole lot. We studied the book of Romans. We studied the book of Ephesians. So even in my high school years, I had someone and I had people that were helping me to understand this whole idea of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be uh, forgiven? What does it mean to live a holy life? But all it took is just for me to attend church on a Sabbath or get into my Bible class and that whole thing would be reinforced of of that it not, got, not only God is holy, but you have to be holy. To be holy is only is God's exclusive attribute. He's the only one. There's no one else. Peter shouted out, you are the holy one of God. Wow. So Peter, in his humanness, he realizes that there is someone in front of him that is exemplifying holiness. But more than that, he realizes that the person who is in front of him is holy. That there's something about Jesus that is different. So, with that in mind, let's get into what, what is this idea of being sanctified. I like to use the example of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is a young guy, it's a young kid, okay? He was in his teenage years when God calls him. And he has a whole life in front of him. And, uh, and if you read Jeremiah, you'll find a very depressive prophet. I don't know what was, what was his life but definitely Jeremiah dealt with very human brokenness. And he is dealing with this. And God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Wow. Before I formed you. You know, that word form is to fashion. There was something that God was saying to Jeremiah. I fashioned you. I know you. And knowing someone can be scary, especially when God says, I know you. That's what he means, that there is a transparency, that there is nothing that he knows about you that is in darkness. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet. So there are two things here that God says to Jeremiah. He says, I sanctified you. I know you. I formed you. I designed you. Okay? But I also sanctified you. And that, that sanctified you means I created you and formed you and know you so that you can be mine. 
In the word sanctification, there is this meaning that God creates something for himself. And he's telling Jeremiah, that's, that's who you are to me. Sanctified is being a person or thing belonging to God. He formed you. He knows you. He sanctifies you. He ordains you. God is telling Jeremiah, I own you. You belong to me. And that is, that is the essence of sanctification. Of God saying, I sanctify you. He says, I have drawn you because I know you. I have drawn you to me because I created you. I formed you. I designed you. And I desire you. And this young kid, he's hearing these words from, from God. And he's hearing, I am his and he is mine. To be sanctified by God means that you are his possession first. That he possesses you. And if there is anything that God desires more than anything, is to have you and me. If he, that's, I think that, that I think that as a father with his father's heart, he desires nothing more and nothing less than to have us, who you are. That's why he tells Jeremiah, "I know you. I know the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life." So God desires us to to be His, to to own us. To possess us. I'll read you another text in a few minutes that reaffirms that. So this is, I think that at the core of sanctification is this idea, once again, that we are possessed and owned by God. And that's his first desire. If he has you and if he has me, he has everything that he had ever desired. He needs nothing else and nothing more. Because when he has us, that's it. His heart is filled. Now, sanctification is something else too. It's to be raised to the, to the sphere of the Father. The, defi the divine sphere is to be drawn into this divine sphere of the Father is to experience God on another, on another level. It is God sharing his life wholeheartedly with us. It is God sharing his life with us. It is learning from him and of him. It's about growing in him because he is growing in us. And it is about us growing in him because there is something that he is doing in our hearts. So sanctification takes us to another level of an experience with God. It's not based on what you do. It's simply based that God has drawn you and me. And he says, I love you. I want you. Stay here with me. That's all I care for. I was reading some book, and I don't even know where I read it, but it's about the, the, the Desert Fathers. There was this, this three monks that visited this father in the desert, and these three monks show up one month, all three of them, and two of them asked a question to the father. He answered those questions, and then the third one didn't say anything. The second month, these three monks show up, and the two, again, ask them questions about their lives, about, you know, spirituality, and about God, about all, any, all, any question they wanted about God. The third month, they show up again, and the two monks ask the father once again a question, and they were getting ready to leave, and the father says, wait a minute. To the third monk, he says, you know, this is the third month that 
you have come here. And you've said not one word. You've asked not one question. What's up with that? No, he didn't say what's up with that, but he said, tell me, what's going on? Like, why? And the monk said this, all I desire when I come here is to be in your presence. That's all I need. No questions. I have no questions, no answers, nothing. For him, it was enough to be in this man's presence. I think that that's what God is. He says, as long as you're with me, in my presence, that satisfies me. And we need to learn how to live in that sphere of experience. Because if not, we fall into the trap of journeying through life, doing stuff to get approved by God, to feel that we're good enough. But really, we never feel good enough. So there is some, there's another part of, of uh, sanctification, and this is a very well-known verse. But I want to just focus on two parts. He says, it says here in 1 Peter, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people. What does it say? For what? God's own possession. That's what we are. We're a people for God's possession. We belong to him. But then in, I just put in big words, letters, so that you may. So that you may do what? Proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You and I exist so that we may. We are chosen. We are priesthood. We are holy. And we belong to God. I did not come up with that. You did not come up with that. That's what God says about you. He he says that about you. What we need to do is embrace that. Embrace that reality that I am chosen, that I'm part of a priesthood, that I share in God's holiness, and I belong to to God. In this that you may, he also gives us a purpose. A holy life is not self-serving. Okay? Once God has us, that's all he needs. And when he has us, then he says, hey, what do you think about doing this for me? You know, when I worked in youth ministries, a lot of parents and a lot of young people would come up to me and say, Hey, Sergio, can you pray that God will reveal his will to me? And I always had issues with that. <laughs> you know? And I, you know, what's God's plan for my life? What's God's purpose for my life? And I was already into these things, and I would say, you know what God desires for you? He desires you. He desires you. He wants you. He wants to possess you. He wants to live with you. That's, he wants you. And sure enough, you know, mom and dad, they would always have issues with that. No, because he needs to know what he's going to do with his life. Well, God wants him. We're sanctified for a purpose. For something. But God isn't just about telling people to have a purpose in life. I know that there's purpose-driven life. I know that you have to find a purpose. I know this. I know all of that stuff. But it isn't just about that. It's about belonging to God and God belonging to you. And have this sense that he owns me. God, when he owns us, and we embrace that, he gives us options. 
it's very funny. I think he has a lot of fun with us because, you know, people pray for God to, especially pastors. You know, I'll, since I'm a pastor, I'll mention this. You know, for a long time, I used to believe that conference officials would meet and they would decide and they would pray. And they would say, oh, we have prayed and we have prayed about this. And, and that's what we invite you to come and come and be a pastor of this church. But what if we happen to me? One committee has been praying, and another committee has been praying, and they both tell you the same thing. What do you do with that? In my case, one of those instances, God had to pluck me out. And boom, he threw me out. It took me about six months to get over it. But he had me. I didn't rebel. I didn't have blood in my eyes. I was embracing that. So, so God, when he has you, he, he really leave it up, leaves it up to us to say, hey, you can go to Miami and be a pastor there, or you can come to the easy life of Orlando. Which one do you want? Or you can go to Ohio like it happened to me, and then I came back in six weeks. How is that? You see? Well, I think that when God has you, this idea of purpose, what you're going to do, he's basically saying, if you are with me, if you embrace this, you will begin to see meaning in purpose in everything that you do. That, ultimately, is sanctification. Sanctify myself. Jesus says, I sanctify myself. What is, what is Jesus saying? Did he need to be sanctified? No. Did he need to be more holy? No. What Jesus is saying, I'm consecrating myself, which is another word for sanctification. I consecrate myself. I surrender myself in sacrifice, as a living sacrifice. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am going to fulfill my mission for which I was chosen for. I am going to do what God the Father has placed in my heart, and I am going to do it no matter what is the sacrifice that I have to make. And this prayer in John 17, which this phrase is part of, it's only a week or two, he knew it was coming. And Jesus is saying, I will sanctify myself. I belong to God, the Father. The Father belongs to me. He has given me a mission. I have chosen to carry on that mission, and I am going to do it. Then he says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What does it mean? So not, Jesus, not only Jesus is, sanctified, is, is satisfied with sanctifying himself, he also wants his disciples to be sanctified. And he says, Father, sanctify them by your truth and sanctify them by your word. In this verse, Jesus could not be more incarnational. He could not be more intimate because literally he's saying to the Father, Father, I am the living word. I am the incarnate word. I am the truth. And Jesus does not separate himself from truth as some philosophy or some doctrine, Jesus does not separate himself from the word, from this 
this Greek understanding, philosophical understanding, he is embracing the reality that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he's saying, Father, if I have done that, since I have done that, and since I am the truth, I please make my disciples embrace my life and my mission. Sanctify them. Which is truly an invitation. I want to propose to you this idea. The sanctification is missional. Sanctification has very little to do with how good your character is, or call it character development. Because at the end, in the first part of my thoughts, is what God desires is you, so that he may wholeheartedly, when he has you, share his life with you. Being fully aware who you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, he invites you to be his. And if he has you, then he takes you. And he says, where do you want to go? What do you want to do for me? Jesus is saying to his father, the same way that I have committed to this mission, do the same thing for my disciples. May they be so intimate with the word and the truth that I may do beautiful and wonderful things through me. You and I exist for others. We exist for others. Sanctification is missional, is being part of God's mission. Not only that, but is being present for others. Is to be present in people's stories. Is to be present in their lives. And do we need some sort of community service project to do that? No. What we need to do is embrace this beautiful reality that I am his and he is mine and he is working and fulfilling his dreams and his plans through me to affect people in their journey in life. That is sanctification. Sanctification really is seen in people who serve others. So I'm going to share a few of those people in my life or that I know. This is Daniel Surian. Daniel Surian, I've known him for about 17 years now. He lives in Cancun. He's from Chiapas. He's in his 30s. When I met him, he was in his early 20s, and we were doing a mission trip in Cancun, and he says, Pastor, would you come and see if you can help us? At that time, Daniel was uh, employed by one of the premier hotels in, in, um, in the hotel zone in Cancun, and he would get to show the presidential suite to the people that would come and visit the hotel. And he, you could see the beautiful Caribbean sea from the presidential suite. He would often say, you know, when I'm all by myself, I just go up there and I open the windows and I open the curtains and I dream of that day when I will have my own home in heaven. So I would always remind, it's not going to be in heaven, Daniel. It's going to be right here in Cancun. 
We're going to build our homes here on earth, on the new earth. He says, anyway, Sergio, he would say, but this is, this is what he would do. And uh, so uh, we went. I went to see where he was worshiping with his family, uh, his wife, his kids, and then a couple of uh, his wife's brother, and maybe I think he had a brother. And this is where they were meeting. This is, the, this is right in the city of Cancun, okay? And uh, so they're waving. And so I said, okay, we'll come. We'll come next summer. So we came next summer and we helped them to do the foundations, okay, of the church. Um, honestly, when we started doing the foundation, I said, man, that, how did he go from that little hut of a church to this? How does he want to build this? And that's what he had designed. That's what he had in his mind. It took us five years to build that building. The first year, the first, the, in the second year, a hurricane came through Cancun, and we finished putting the roof that summer. And two months later, this hurricane came through, and that church became a refuge and a shelter for that very poor community. He had a vision of serving. What does he do? He does the same thing that I do. So he has his own mission trips now in Mexico. He does community projects for people. These are some of the guys. He's the whole team. That's what he does in the parks in different parts of Mexico. Look at all those kids. This is Daniel. Probably one of the most holiest person that I have ever met. Not that he talks like a holy person because he's so human. But because he's serving, he's fulfilling. I call this Hermana Ramirez. She has come to two of our projects. She is just una viejita, just this old lady. And this is when she's taking a break. But this is what she does. Check out her shoes. That's what she does with other ladies. Because when we go to Cancun, we don't build a church for the people. We build a church with the people. So she comes. And I have sat with her. I have talked with her. In fact, that day when I took that picture, she was just sitting there. And this is her just coming down. She goes up to the roof. You see the roof that we were almost finished. She checks out things and she walks up and down. And this is her. Is she a holy person? You bet she is. Amazing human being. You know what I have discovered about people that are holy? They're compassionate. The three C's. They're compassionate, they're committed, and they're courageous. Compassion drives them. It drives Daniel. It drives La Hermana Ramirez. It drives a lot of the people that I work with there in Mexico. And it drives these two young women. These two young women, Paige and Kate on the right, they used to work at Altima, at the hospital there, when I was a pastor to the employees. And they received a request to provide creation, what used to be, what used to be called creation health, for foster older kids. These were like 17, 18, 19 years old foster kids. And they brought them to Altamont for seven weeks. On the seventh week, uh, Kate and Paige invited me if I would kind of wrap it up with some spiritual thing and some visioning about these kids. And here they are, and this is Sebastian, my son-in-law. He sang a few songs for them. He framed things for me, and then I invited the kids, these young 
older teenagers to envision their lives. And I said, look, if you don't envision your life, other people will do that for you. If you don't see yourself somewhere, if you don't realize that God is with you and for you, there something else will come. So I gave them a poster, sheet of paper. We gave them markers, and I said, take a few minutes to reflect on what, on what would you like your mission in life to be. It was amazing. This is what they were saying. I got to turn around and read it. Wow. These kids were an example of being holy. You might think, well, this or that. But they caught something. They caught a glimpse in that moment that I had with them. Maybe 15 minutes. They caught a glimpse that they were enough for God. They caught a glimpse that somehow there was something greater for them. They caught a glimpse. They embraced that. They made it their own. And they said, I want to make a difference. In the midst of their brokenness, They wanted to strengthen the helpless and love the unlovable. That's what it means to be holy. The joy of a holy life, I see it in people who serve others. Sanctification for a lot of people is self-serving. I've been in circles where people talk about we need to be sanctified to be ready for the Lord. That is very self-serving. That's about you. What God desires is to have you. To have you. And when he has you, then he says, what do you want to do for me? How can I use you? How can I take the skills, your passion? How can I take your personality? How can I take who you are and use it to extend my love for others? So what is your mission? What are you embracing? Are you just a very self-serving person or you're here for a greater purpose do you have the courage to move beyond where you are right now even if that will require sacrifice because it's about knowing your mission it's about being awake and aware of your place in this world is being able to say I am here too why are you here I am here for what what is that greater purpose that drives you? What is that greater good that you're about in your life here? There was a, just down the road with this Spanish church meets now, there was a pastor there. His name is uh, Clinton Brown. And he wrote this beautiful song. It's called I want to be more like you. 
I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel that you work through. I want to be more like you. That's what it means to live a holy life. That we are like Jesus and that we are his vessel. This is him singing that song. Will we be able to hear it? Maybe not. But anyway, we're not going to take time to get it going. But, and this man, Clinton Brown, has written hundreds and hundreds of songs. This happens to be my favorite because it focuses on, I want to be like Jesus, and I want to be his vessel. In your journey in life, may you find the joy of a holy life, which in essence is serve others in his name, compassionately, committed, and courageously. God bless you. Okay. Father, <clears throat> thank you for inviting us to be yours and wholly yours because that's all you desire. You want us. Because you know perfectly well that once we're with you, once we're with you, your heart is filled. And then you allow us to serve you by serving others here on earth. Guide us through this journey of life that we may not be self-serving people, but that we may be holy people serving others in your name.